Uh, today's service is going to be a tad more interactive than I, I typically do. Um, and keeping with that theme, I'm wondering if there's somebody who'd be willing to read our passage this morning. So it's Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Is there somebody who'd be willing to, to read that out loud for us? Because it's God word to the whole congregation. It's our word that he's given to us, not just something the pastor holds. Ryan, thank you. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, (laughs) rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who have belonged to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and being one another. Thank you, Ryan. Please pray with me as we come to God's Word. Spirit, these are your words. This is your sword that you wield in our lives to, um, to call us into a relationship with you, to, to point out areas in our life that aren't submitted to you, to um, let us sit at your feet and, 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 and hear from you. And, and we ask this morning that as, as you've been so present already working um, in drawing our hearts into worship, drawing our hearts into this, this prayer and worship time and sharing and exalting you. Lord, already you've been here, and I ask that you would be here as we look at your word, that you would speak to us, that you would uh, use me and speak through me. Um, but God, we want you to be exalted. We want to touch you and know you and be close to you this morning and every day. Um, and that's a work of your spirit, and so we ask and we come to you that you would meet us, that you would bring glory to the name of Jesus, that you would exalt the Father. Come, Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is applying the truth that he's already presented. And so the last two weeks, we've started looking at the application that Paul has presented to us. But I thought it might be a good idea to just real quick recap what Paul's message was kind of a summary of Paul's message to the Galatians, the truth that he's applying to their lives. In Galatians 2, 19 through 20, we say, we read that through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The truth that Paul's been presenting is that the Jewish law was given to us so that we would understand our sin and so that we could die to it, so that we could realize that there was a judgment against us, that Jesus paid for us. He crucified, he was crucified on our behalf. And so we die to the law. We die to the standard of righteousness that God has presented to us. But because Jesus is resurrected, we are resurrected. And so then we are resurrected outside of that standard, outside of that requirement to uh, prove ourselves righteous before God. And instead, we are resurrected with the righteousness that Jesus has. And we are united to him. And because Jesus is righteous, we have a hope that in the end, when we, come, or, uh, we die and we are resurrected and we stand before a throne and we stand before a judgment seat, that God will look at us, he will see our names written in his book of life. He will see our names connected to Jesus and he will say, Jesus' righteousness covers you. This is the truth that Paul's presenting. He's saying that this is your hope. This is the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. And the context for our application in 16 through 26 um, is verse, chapter five, verse one. For freedom... Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, 
and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And then 5.13, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. And Paul is trying to argue and prove to the Galatian church that they can trust this gospel message. They can trust that Jesus' gospel, that he gives us his righteousness, that we have a hope of righteousness in him, this is the only way for us to find freedom. Every other ideology, every other religion, every other form of relating to God is about law-keeping, and it leads us to slavery. He says, trust this gospel. And he says, your flesh is still active. He says, that's not a surprise. That doesn't catch us off guard. Your flesh is still a part of the life that you're living right now. Even in that original statement in 2.20, he says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In your flesh and its desi- your sinful desires, there's a struggle that you're engaged with right now. As your heart longs to rebel, as your heart longs to be the God of your life, to say, this is what is good and I will run for this, and this is what is evil and I will run for this, rather than submit and listen to God. And Paul says, don't use your freedom, don't use the power of the gospel as a license to do evil, to listen to your flesh to give opportunity to your flesh. Before we go any further, I want to give us a picture for us to keep in the back of our head as we think through what he says in verse 16 through 26. I have a bowl of candy, okay? Now, as parents, a bowl of candy is forbidden fruit for our kids, right? This is, if I have a bowl of candy sitting on a table at our house, that's not something that Lewis has free access to. Nope. And if Lewis gets free access to this and decides to eat that bowl of candy, he will wreak havoc on our household's sense of calm and peace. And he's going to have a bellyache, right? He's going to be sick. This is bad for him. So he shouldn't have this. And if I'm a good parent, I need to make sure that he doesn't just eat all of this. And so I better make sure that there's something between him and that candy, right? Uh, Some sort of a barrier. Something that will tell him that this is off limits, that there's a law between him and the candy. Okay, out of sight, out of mind. Pause the home illustration for a moment. Imagine Lewis and Tozer are sitting in the front aisle right here. They're seeing me do this. They're listening to the illustration. And I sit here, and I welcome them to come up. Lewis and Tozer are right here with me. And I say, Lewis and Tozer, you just saw me hide the candy there. You know that that's not okay. Would you like to sit and hang out with me for a little bit? What are they thinking about? The candy. Do they want to sit and spend time with me in that moment? Probably not. I probably haven't done this right. I've done something. Okay, here's, we're going we're gonna to increase the barrier, okay? This will work, right? If I just make them know that it's off limits, then I can sit over here. I can say, Lewis and Tozer, do you want to be with me? And now what are they thinking about? The candy. They're still thinking about the candy. Lewis is pretty smart. So he might look at the candy. He might look at me and say, yes, I'll sit with you. I'd love to talk with you about candy. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't, the law, the barrier hasn't worked yet, right? It's not functioning to keep them from thinking about the candy. It's certainly not helping them be with me. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure they understand this is off limits, Okay. I'm going to add some weight to this law. Definitely make sure that they know they cannot get to this. And that's not a recipe for disaster at all. (laughs) So I sit over here with Lewis and Tozer. After having made it obvious that they can't get the candy, saying, this is off limits, don't eat that, bad for you, do you want to spend some time with me now? What are they thinking about? They're still thinking about the candy. What Paul's gospel has said is that we are free from the law. We are no longer underneath this restrictive um, standard that tells us 
You cannot do these things. If you do these things, you will be judged and you will be declared guilty. The law has been removed. And that creates a concern. Because if I remove the law from the forbidden fruit, from the candy, the question is, what's to prevent people from going for the candy? What's to prevent people from going for the f- things that their flesh just wants to do, but will give them a bellyache, will cause separation between them and God, will still cause pain in their lives, even if the judgment has actually been removed? What's going what's to hold us back? And to that, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So the external barrier of the law that was given to us by Moses and was a guardian for our morality, guarding us against this, helping us understand why this was bad, that's been removed and it's been replaced with an internal power, an internal motivator or this renewed desire. Instead of desiring to sin, the Spirit has been given to us, the heart of God has been given to us to desire righteousness, to desire a walk with God, to desire things that are actually satisfying and don't lead to destructive separation, pain, evil. And now as we combat our desires in the flesh, which he says, you know, that's still there. You're still going to struggle. There's a tug of war that's going to be going on in your life as you still long to sin, but at the same time now the Spirit's been given to you and you long to be with God and you long to know him and you long to love the way he has loved. This tug of war that's going on in your heart is now controlled not by fear of judgment, not by just a, a barrier between me and the thing I want, but it's, it's controlled by faith that as the Spirit calls me to something good, I can trust him. It's controlled by a faith that if the Spirit says no to this, it's probably because he loves me. It's controlled by faith. Christ died because of this. I believe that. I trust that. And I trust that he is now going to lead me away from that and toward eternal life, knowing God the Father, knowing the one he sent. And so the thing holding us back from our sin is faith. It's a desire of the Spirit that's been given to us. It's a relationship with the Spirit, with God that's been given to us. And it's while that's there and the condemnation and the judgment has been removed, it doesn't mean I just run for it because there's been an upgrade to my ability to say no to my flesh. So why does God choose this method, this idea of putting his spirit inside of us, giving us new desires, the desires of God, the desires of the spirit? Why does he choose this rather than the very safe, intuitive method of putting a big law between us and the activity? Because as a parent, this is a go-to method, you know, like getting something, putting it off limits. In our house, we don't just leave candy on the table free for people to grab. We take that candy and it's hidden up on top of a fridge where Lewis and Tozer can't get to it. It's natural and normal to create consequences, discipline, barriers around bad behavior in order to help people change towards good behavior and choose good behavior. So why does God choose, instead of amping up the law, making a better, higher, more um, judgmental form of the law, you know, increase the level of discipline, why instead does he choose to remove it and replace it with an internal desire that comes from his spirit to long for something else? Well, read with me Galatians 24 and 25. 5, 24 and 25. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And here's what God has done and he does through the Spirit that he can't do with a law. 
First of all, he goes after the real issue. He goes deep into our heart and he fixes the real problem. Because as I long for sin, as I long to live in my flesh and control for myself what's good and evil and decide that that's good, as I do that and I live for what I desire, no barrier or judgment against that thing is going to change the fact that that's what I want. And I'm going to look for loopholes if I can. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for a way to get around that if I can. I'm going to try to figure out how to get a chair next to the fridge and then pile on top of that a container so I can climb up and get to that thing. I'm going to lie about whether or not I took the candy. I'm going to try to figure out how to get the thing I want without getting the punishment, without getting the judgment. And while it may protect me a little bit from that, it hasn't fixed the problem that I'm still running towards that. So what does God do? He goes after the desire. He goes into the heart and he says, here's a new desire. Here's something else that you can want, something better, something more satisfying, something good. And so we have these two lists right in the middle of this passage. And he says, here's the things that the flesh wants for you. It wants you to have instant gratification. Things that cause pain eventually. Things that we shudder and find gross eventually. This is what the flesh wants. But I'm calling you to something new. I'm calling you to the fruit of my spirit. Things that everybody agrees, yeah, wouldn't it be great if people knew me as loving? If I was a person who was known for being joyful, if I was kind, good. He says, I'm going to put these desires in you. I'm going to awaken a desire for these things in you, and I'm going to pull you away from the desires of the flesh and give you new desires, things that are consistent with the character of God, things that draw you close to God rather than things that separate you and pull you away. Jesus has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, and he's given us new desires by giving us the Spirit. And the, the flesh that's still alive and functioning, it's, it's a dead flesh that has less power than it used to have. It's still there, and Paul doesn't really say that it's gone altogether away, but he's crucified it. It's lost its control over us. We are no longer slaves to our flesh because he's given us his desires. He's given us his Spirit. And we long for something new now. The second thing we see there, though, in verse 25 especially, is that the problem with the law as the the thing that guards us against sin is that our hearts now have turned our back to God and we're longing to rebel. We're longing to break away from God. We're longing to go after the role of authority in our life for ourselves and set ourselves up as kings, set ourselves up as God. And all of that is severing relationship. All of that is running away from intimacy. And then what does God do? He says, okay, I'm not going to use a law to fix this. I'm going to pursue intimacy with you to fix this. I'm going to send my spirit to be closer connected to you than any other relationship. It's going to be indwelling you. And the language that Paul uses to describe this is walking step in step with the Spirit. Galatians 5, 1 through 15 talks about slavery and being freed from slavery. And Galatians 16 through 26 talks about walking with a friend. Walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. And there's this picture of the Spirit walking with us through life. He's pursued intimacy with us. He's drawn close to us. And the relationship that is broken as we rebel, he has taken the first step of bringing back and restoring, helping us turn around and walk with him. So the Spirit giving us a new desire to long for God, to long for the things that are good in life, that are satisfying, is better than just a law that tells us not to do this because of judgment. We replace the fear of judgment with faith in a loving Spirit and a good God. Now run back to the illustration for a second. And imagine I'm sitting over here, right? So I'm over here. Lewis and Tozer come up and I'm asking them, you know, would you like to spend some time with me or would you like to eat the bowl of candy? But this time it's 25, 30 years from now. 
And so you're imagining Lewis and Tozer, they're all grown up. And I'm asking them, do you want to eat a bowl of candy or would you like to spend time with dad? And God willing, after 25 to 30 years of <laughs> discipline, of training, of love, of spending time with them, of staying up late talking about the girls that they like, of, <laughs> of playing ball with Tozer, they've found something out, haven't they? They've learned that the long relationship with their dad of love is better than the bowl of candy. God willing. (laughs) And this is the path of the Spirit that God has chosen to walk with us. He said, I'm going to walk with you as your counselor and your friend. All life, all through life, and day by day, I'm going to call you to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I'm going to call you away from the desires of your flesh. And as we walk with him, he shows us that he loves us so that we can learn to want to sit with him and, have, and talk with him and be with him. So what's, what's our role in all of this? Well, this is Paul's application, so there is something for us to walk away with, it, you know, an action for us to take. And the first one is faith. It's the same thing that he's been calling us to all along. We're called to trust that the Spirit actually loves us and that as the Spirit calls us to something other than what we want in that moment, that he has a, a map of life, if you will. We're walking with him. He's our guide. He's our lead. And he has this map of life and he knows what the bigger picture is. If we decide to go after the thing in our flesh that we want, he knows that road. And you know where that road leads. And he says, if you come this direction, if you come this way and love, joy, peace, and all the things that I call you to sit with God, be with me, he knows where that leads. And so we're called to trust in the moment when I really, really want this thing, maybe that's road rage, you know, you're on the road, you really want to cut this erratic driver off, you really want to yell at the person, that feels like it's going to be satisfying, that feels like it's going to give closure. And the Spirit says, well, I'd like to lead you into love and patience and kindness. Why don't you back up and let him move in? Let him merge. We have to trust he has the bigger map. We have to believe, we have to learn to believe that he longs for what is good for us. That he's not trying to trick us up and use us. He's not trying to steal our happiness and steal our joy. He longs that we would be satisfied in God for all of eternity. And he knows the path there. And there's a part where we're releasing control of what we prefer and and what we desire. So I and I get that because of what Paul says in verse 17. He said, For these, the desire of the spirit and the desire of the flesh, these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And Paul, it's it's interesting, he's talked about the flesh, and he's talked about the spirit, the flesh, spirit, flesh, spirit, and then he goes, you. And here's how that works, because I want both of these things, right? And the Christian life is a path forward where we don't ever get all of what we want, because we want things that are opposed to each other. On one hand, if I want the flesh, and if I go for the flesh, then there's a part of me that longs to be close to God that I say no to. And if I live for the flesh, then I don't get to do the thing I want to do, which is draw close to God to experience the fruit of the Spirit. And if I flip that around and I go the other direction, and if I pursue the Spirit, there's a part of me that I have to acknowledge still wants the things of the flesh, that I have to be willing to say no to. I have to be ready to let go of that. And so there's there's a releasing of control, and we're now our role is to learn to say, the things of the flesh that I want. 
I'm willing to let God redefine that. I'm willing to let God call me away from that. I'm willing to let God change the things I want so that I can pray with the psalmist. I'm going to forget the verse now, but I'm going to pray with the psalmist that all of my desire, the desires of my heart have been, or I'm going to go there, Psalm 37, 4. He will grant the desires of my heart. And why can I pray? How can I know that he's going to grant the desires of my heart? Because I've been willing to submit my heart and teach, let him teach me to trust in the Lord, to do good, to dwell in the land, befriend faithfulness, and to delight yourself in the Lord. Those aren't natural, normal desires. Those are desires that come from the Spirit. And I've let go of the desires that are opposed to those things. And so then I can pray then I can acknowledge, then I can worship God and say, he has given me the desires of my heart. So, we're going to close out our message this morning. I tried to keep it a little bit shorter because I wanted to do something here at the end. It's a message about listening to the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, walking by the Spirit. So I have these little pieces of paper that I'm going to have our ushers bring up. And on one side of the paper it says flesh, and on the other side it says spirit. And we're going to take a time, of like a couple minutes. There should be in baskets right there, little blue papers and pens. We're going to take a couple moments, and there's these two lists in here, right? Paul gives us these two different lists. And then what I'd like us to do is pray and ask the Spirit to show us the desires of our flesh. And use that first list and meditate through that first list and ask Him to draw out from that first list things that we desire that we haven't maybe given up yet that still have some control over our lives. And maybe you're going to write down a word from that list. Maybe you're going to write down something that that list reminds you of in your life. But write down the desire of the flesh. And then go to the second list, the list that is called the fruit of the Spirit. And flip your little piece of paper over, and on the other side where it says Spirit, Ask the Spirit to show you what His desire is that's opposed to the desire of your flesh. What is it that He wants to call you in and bring you into that He wants to cultivate in your life? And then you'll have this little piece of paper and you'll be able to go and like you can take it with you and you, as you go and process through um, and you're doing life and on Monday morning when it, you're struggling with the desire of the flesh, you have a little piece of paper that you can flip over and you can say, this is sin, this is the flesh, And the Spirit wants me to desire this other thing right now. I don't know what that is, and that's why it's vague right now here. But I trust and we have faith in the Spirit that he's going to speak to each of us. That as we look at his word, he has something for each of us to take home, to apply. All right, and I'll pray to open us to open us off. William and Deanna are going to do some instrumentals for us. But then I'm going to actually sit down, I'm going to join you, and I'm going to do this too, because I'm in the same boat as all of us. Like I, the Spirit wants to grow and lead me too. Um, after a few minutes of, of going through and, and prayer and, and listening to him, I'll, uh, I'll close us out. Spirit, we do invite you and we praise you that you are our uh, counselor and that we all have a direct access to you, that your word is to each of us and you are our teacher and we don't need somebody in between us and you. So I ask that you would speak to each of us this morning, that you would guide us and, and pull our, our sin out, uh, reveal it to us, and give us the humility to see it and acknowledge it. And Lord, would you then please show us where you want to take us next, the desire that you want to give us, the wholesome, loving um, direction that you have for us. We thank you. We open ourselves up to you. In Jesus' name. My, uh, my last thought for this morning is that the two things that you've written down here, uh, the thing that you've written on the side of the flesh, that does not disqualify you for the love of God. That does not disqualify you from the forgiveness that Jesus has purchased for you. And the thing that you've written on the other side, the thing that he calls you to, that is not how you gain your righteousness and that you gain his love. Because he loves you, he wants this for you.